the actions of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in its 144th year centered appropriately on this man, Spencer Woolley Kimball. He'd been ordained and set apart as prophet, seer, and revelator only two days before 1974 began, following the unexpected death of President Harold B. Lee. President Lee has gone. I never thought it could happen. I sincerely wanted it never to happen. I doubt if anyone in the church has prayed harder and more consistently for a long and general welfare life for President Lee than Mike Camilla and myself. I have not been ambitious. I am four years older than Brother Lee to the exact day March 28th. I have expected that I would go long before he would go. My heart cries out to him and for him how we loved him. At age 79, it was a calling he had not sought, yet many believed that he had been preserved to be the prophet. As a young boy, he nearly drowned but was revived. At age 13, he contracted typhoid and lay near death for weeks. Smallpox followed. After he was called to the Council of the Twelve, he suffered several heart attacks, and then, in 1957, developed cancer of the throat and vocal cords. Each experience was a preparing, a testing, a tempering. He prevailed and grew in strength and stature. For he was, as President Lee once said, no ordinary man. When the call came to be the 12th president of the church, President Kimball was ready. He set about during 1974, his first year in office, to comfort a people who had lost two beloved prophets in less than 18 months. To express his love and manifest his leadership to the Scandinavian saints in their own land. To give his people a new vision of missionary work. To open a new house of the Lord to challenge and counsel, inspire and instruct, explain and expound, and in his goodness, to touch people everywhere with the truthfulness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Under President Kimball's direction, the church in 1974 was distinguished not by newness, nor by the dramatic change of the early 1970s, but by steadiness and stability. He set the tone at April conference. This is a day of consolidating our efforts and form, firming up our programs and reaffirming our policies. Two days later, on April 6th, he was sustained in a solemn assembly in the tabernacle. Thousands of others who were listening throughout the world also raised their hands. Nineteen seventy-four saw the completion of the fifteen million dollar Washington Temple above the Capitol Beltway in Kensington, Maryland. It is sheathed in white marble and capped by six metal spires of twenty-four karat gold. This nine-level structure, largest of all the church's temples, had been under construction since late nineteen sixty-eight. The angel Moroni statue was 288 feet above the ground, as high as though it were on a 16-story building. 300 invited guests, including government and church leaders, witnessed the impressive completion ceremony on September 9th. The temple is the house of God. It belongs to God. It's his dwelling place. It's a place where God reveals his presence to his faithful saints. 
and they're always built with the finest materials and by the finest craftsmen that can be assembled. And we have no finer building in the church today than this temple. We're a temple building people. We believe in eternity. We believe in permanence. We believe in righteousness. And we believe that the Lord is at the helm and his revelations will continue to direct us in the paths that we should go. President Kimball and other dignitaries applied mortar to the cornerstone, behind which a time capsule was sealed. Afterward, one of the largest press conferences in church history was held, involving over a hundred reporters and photographers. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a delight to us to meet you under these circumstances. We are glad you came. We hope that uh, you will be profit by it. When asked by a reporter... So how do you account for the uh, growth in membership of the church at a time when some other denominations are losing members? I would say that uh, because we teach the truth, and if the people of this world knew what we know about the truths that we teach, there would be great numbers who would be eager to become members of the church. It's basic, it's true, it's divine, it is right. Supreme Court Chief Justice Warren Burger, Mrs. Betty Ford, wife of United States President Gerald Ford, and over a hundred congressional leaders toured the temple. Well, this was a real, truly great experience for me. I think the temple is one of great beauty and a great addition to our surroundings here in Washington. And it's a really an inspiration to all of us. Oh, yes, I think just to look at it from even a distance, it's such an inspiration. It'll, it'll be a wonderful addition to Washington. I think that uh, by seeing the very lovely uh, concepts, uh, the beautiful heavenly connotations, it certainly gives one a very uh, specific, a very appealing, and a very positive uh, image of the Mormon church that uh, I lacked before. So this was just really the ultimate to be able to come to your temple tonight, uh, to be in the atmosphere of reverence that we felt so strongly when we were there. In all, more than 750,000 people went through the temple during the eight weeks it was open to the public. Visiting hours had to be extended to meet the public demand. And I think non-members will see the edifice, see the building, become interested, and questions will be asked. It'll be a great missionary tool as well as a place for holy ordinances to be performed. I am so pleased with, uh, with this fabulous painting which Everybody sees they enter this temple. John Scott has spent a whole year uh, doing this painting. He's, he's really uh, given everything he had to it because he knew how important it was. As uh, Brother Fetzer said in there today, that the uh, architect's dream is to do a temple. And I'm very much interested in the windows, those uh, faceted glass windows at the end. They've turned out exceptionally well. It was all so beautiful and it felt so special just to be in there. And and as I kind of looked in the mirror, it seemed like I almost got a little, you know, caught a little glimpse of what it might look like someday all dressed in white, ready to be married to someone for eternity. I believe that uh, this is the most important thing as far as the church is concerned that's happened on the East Coast ever. In events related to the temple opening, President Kimball and Elder Hinckley offered opening prayers at congressional sessions. And the Tabernacle Choir gave four sellout concerts in the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. United States President Gerald Ford, who attended one of the concerts, visited with President and Sister Kimball. In November, President Kimball presided over 10 temple dedicatory sessions. All of the general authorities spoke except two. 40,000 members from the Temple District attended. The dedication was, said President Kimball, a time of rejoicing. 
President Kimball also said, the people in this area have waited long and longingly for this temple. It's been 144 years since the church was restored, and now we have a beautiful temple here. When we really understand the sacred nature and the importance, we can understand why Brigham Young asked the people to sacrifice and build the Salt Lake Temple. As the newest house of the Lord was being dedicated, two others, the St. George and Arizona, were being renovated. They would remain closed for many months, after which they would be open for public tours and then rededicated. Work went forward throughout the year on other buildings and facilities important in other ways to the mission of the church. In March, Elder Mark E. Peterson dedicated the enlarged St. George Visitor Center. In April, the First Presidency released details of the Visitor Center in the 36-story office building the church was constructing in New York City. In July, ground was broken on the East Bench near the Provo Temple for the church's language training mission. President Ezra Taft Benson gave the keynote address. This is a great moment in the history of the missionary program of the church. Today we are breaking ground for the first major facility designed and built for the express purpose of training missionaries, of preparing them to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The eight building complex was designed to accomplish language training for all foreign missions two years were scheduled for its completion. A major theme of President Kimball in 1974 was missionary work. The prophet said, we should not be satisfied with 100,000 converts a year out of the four billion people in the world who need the gospel. He called on every young man to prepare himself for a mission. And he admonished church members everywhere to advance missionary work. Ordinary levels of performance were not acceptable, he said. It was time to do a better job, to lengthen our strike. In the weeks that followed, that phrase became a rallying cry, not only for enhanced missionary effort, but for improvement in every aspect of individual and collective church performance. Even as President Kimball called for greater growth, the church was, in fact, moving forward dramatically. Before the year ended, there were six new full-time missions, bringing the total to 114. 46 new stakes, bringing the total to 675. And 64,353 new members, bringing the total to 3,385,909. 17 of the new stakes were outside the United States. Three of the new missions were abroad as well. Japan received its sixth mission, Argentina its fourth, and the Philippines its second. Of the new members, 21% lived in countries other than the United States. In January, plans were announced to change all state names so they would describe their geographical locations. For example, a similar announcement concerning the change of mission names was made later in the year. The Church College of Hawaii at Laia was merged with BYU in April and renamed the Brigham Young University Hawaii Campus. 
At the closing session of the combined Aaronic Priesthood and Melchizedek Priesthood MIA conference in June, President Kimball underscored the move toward priesthood-oriented programs. The responsibility for these programs properly rested, he said, upon the presiding bishopric, who by revelation constitute the presidency of the Aaronic Priesthood. The term Aaronic Priesthood MIA was discontinued and replaced by Aaronic Priesthood and Young Women. In the fall, in order to devote full effort to meeting the health needs of saints worldwide, the church divested itself of the 15 hospitals it had operated for many years in Utah, Idaho, and Wyoming. The hospitals, with a replacement value of $107 million, were turned over to a non-church, non-profit corporation. The First Presidency emphasized that the divestment in no way signified loss of concern for the sick and afflicted. In fact, they reported that church health services would be greatly expanded throughout the world. For example, many more health services missionaries were to be called to augment the 120 already serving on American Indian reservations and in 22 countries around the world. President Kimball called several men and women to high positions in 1974 to join those already at his side and to replace those who were to be released. At April conference, three new general authorities were called or given new assignments. L. Tom Perry as a member of the Council of the Twelve, and J. Thomas Fyans and Neil A. Maxwell as assistants to the Twelve. Elder Perry, when asked how he felt when he received his new call, responded, Oh, well, this was, this was just <laughs> unbelievable. We were overwhelmed. When I first told him, Lee just shook his head from side to side this way and said, Oh, no, Dad, you know what that means? It means you have to go out every week and give a talk. And you know you've never been very good at that sort of thing. <laughs> Elder Perry served as assistant to the Twelve before his calling to the Council of the Twelve. He and his wife, Virginia, have three children. Managing Director of Internal Communications for the Church, J. Thomas Fiance, commented on his new calling. And I think of the challenge of the general authorities, and that is to set the church in order all over the world and realize that I'm going to be a small part of that. It's just overwhelming. Elder Fiennes and his wife, Helen, are parents of five children. Elder Fiennes said of his new calling, it's been a very sobering, challenging, mind-stretching, soul-searching experience. As I indicated in my brief acceptance remarks, that I regard the appointment not as vindication, but as an invitation, an invitation for me to be better and to do better. Church Commissioner of Education, Neil A. Maxwell, remains in that position in addition to his duties as an assistant to the Twelve. Elder Maxwell and his wife, Colleen, are parents of three daughters and a son. We have extended to Sister Bell S. Spafford an honorable release as president of the Relief Society and to her counselors, Marianne C. Sharp and Louise W. Madsen, and also to the entire general board, an honorable release. Their work has been a service of quality and devotion and sacrifice. Sister Spafford has been a strong and vibrant voice in many lands and many countries and among many people. Sister Barbara B. Smith was sustained as the new president of the world's largest and oldest continuous women's organization. Sustained as her counselors were Janeth R. Cannon and Marion R. Boyer. The primary association received a new general presidency as well. Released were Sister Laverne W. Parmley and her two counselors, Naomi Ward Randall and Florence R. Lane. Sister Parmley had served for 23 years. The labors of these sisters will bear fruit long into the future through the lives and the deeds of the children whom they have influenced. With her counselors and general board, Sister Parmley has been a ministering angel to the little ones of the church. I had the joy and satisfaction of seeing the primary grow 
until in 1974, one half million children were being taught to pray and to walk uprightly before the Lord by 100,000 officers and teachers. Sustained to the primary presidency were Sister Naomi M. Shumway as general president and Sarah B. Paulson and Colleen B. Lemon as counselors. The prophet made another announcement that caught many by surprise. The release of Richard P. Condy as conductor of the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. Brother Condy had been at the choir podium for 37 years, 20 as assistant conductor and 17 as conductor. J. E. Welch, assistant choir conductor since 1947, was sustained as the new conductor. There was inevitably a dark side to 1974. There were adversities that plagued church members in various parts of the world. Throughout the year, welfare services joined in to assist the cases like these and in many other less acute situations. Nearly 110,000 people received church welfare help in 1974, and over 17,000 were placed in remunerative employment. During the severe fuel and power shortages of 1974, the First Presidency urged conservation of resources. Members were encouraged to walk to meetings, join carpools, and lower home thermostats. The church's pioneer past was honored in some extraordinary ways during the year. On July 24th, the United States Senate passed a resolution commending the Mormon pioneers for their many achievements. In August, two roadways were named in honor of Mormon pioneers. A 22-mile stretch of Mountain Road in El Dorado County, California, was designated the Mormon Immigrant Trail and a 10-mile section of highway not far from Winter Quarters, Nebraska, was named the Mormon Trail Interstate. On June 1st, the 173rd anniversary of the birth of Brigham Young, a monument at his gravesite was dedicated to the Mormon pioneers by President N. Eldon Tanner. It was entitled, All is Well, and included plaques honoring the authors of church hymns. In March, the church exchanged the Brigham Young Forest Farm Home in Salt Lake City for the Utah State-owned Jacob Hamlin House and Brigham Young Winter Home in Southern Utah. The two homes would be maintained as visitor and information centers. Some church-related accomplishments in 1974 were significant for the unique way in which they distinguished gospel programs and people. Professional golfer Johnny Miller who had repeatedly told sports writers his church and family were more important to him than golf, was named U.S. Athlete of the Year. The Osmonds, popular family singing group, were rated by their fellow performers Outstanding Performers of the Year and received the People's Choice Award. Keith Merrill won an Oscar for his feature-length documentary, The Great American Cowboy. In his acceptance speech, viewed by millions, he thanked his parents for their spiritual guidance. Phyllis Brown Marriott of Washington, D.C., was named 1974 National Mother of the Year. She began her reign by saying, I think the most important thing that I've been able to say to all groups of people is that I am a product of my church the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This to me is very important. Dr. Alexander Schreiner, in grateful appreciation for 50 years of devoted and masterful service as tabernacle organist, 1924-1974. Dr. Church Alexander Schreiner Christ. was honored by the First Presidency for 50 years of distinguished service as tabernacle organist. In April 1974, the entire Council of the Twelve 
met for one of their infrequent group photo sessions. On the front row, moving left to right, is President Ezra Taft Benson, Mark E. Peterson, Delbert L. Stapley, LeGrand Richards, Hugh B. Brown, and Howard W. Hunter. Back row standing is Gordon B. Hinckley, Thomas S. Monson, Boyd K. Packer, Marvin J. Ashton, Bruce R. McConkie, L. Tom Perry. The first group temple excursion from Hong Kong took place in April. They were typical of faithful saints everywhere who sacrificed greatly to perform the sacred temple ordinances. Today we have uh, uh, 17 people from Hong Kong and we have some students here, Chinese students here at BYU coming through too with us. This is the first temple excursion from Hong Kong to receive their own endowments. When asked how they felt about going through the temple? Peaceful and calm. Oh, wonderful. Very happy. Well, I think when they return back to Hong Kong, they will set a very good examples to the people over there. And uh, these people will be the tools for the gospel to uh, be spread to the mainland China in the future. National exposure came to the church during Mormon week in July at Expo 74 in Spokane, Washington. President Kimball gave three speeches during the week and the Tabernacle Choir presented two concerts. There was also a Pioneer Day Parade followed by a Mormon Youth Dance Festival. The Mormon Pavilion, constructed partially on pilings in the Spokane River, was inspired by the Golden Plates. It featured an exhibit entitled Ancient America Speaks, complete with automated mannequins. During the six months the pavilion was open, it hosted more than 300,000 visitors from 60 countries. 20,000 received copies of the Book of Mormon. In August, President Kimball and other general authorities journeyed to Stockholm to greet and meet with the saints at the Scandinavia Area General Conference. We are going to Stockholm to the conference because we have three boys in the school aides and we want them to meet the general authorities and to listen to the prophet. With great personal sacrifice, they came from the far corners of four nations. Forty-five hundred saints from Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and Finland gathered in St. Eric's Fair and Convention Center to see the first prophet to visit their lands in 22 years. Some, like the people who gathered to hear the prophet Benjamin, pitched their tents around about, every man according to his family. Well, th this is a lifetime uh, opportunity. And we... Have you never seen the prophet before? We have read about him and we have learned about him, but this is the first time. We'll see. We're very proud of the strong, capable people of these lands. President Benson called Mormon youth a light unto the world. Elder Boyd K. Packer admonished his listeners to inspire their families and non-members. In all, 36 addresses were given in seven sessions, each requiring translation into four other tongues. <laughs> The cultural evening, an important part of every area general conference, featured 400 participants in a colorful display of the performing arts. <laughs> Members of each nation shared their unique culture with the other nations.
The unifying influence of the gospel of Jesus Christ was everywhere evident, but never more beautifully expressed than during the closing number when all the nations sang as one. As the conference closed, President Kimball again stressed the importance of missionary work. Remember the slogan President David O. McKay gave us? Every member a missionary. That includes all members, old and young, and even the children. They have helped to convert many hundreds of good people. This is your privilege. This is your duty. This is a command from the presidency of the church and from your Lord. This has been a really great conference to uh, see the prophet make his humble uh, testimony, I think, was a great experience to me. If every member of the church do that the prophet told us, the church grow up double and double again all over, over the world. Den känslan det är att man kan resa tror jag världen runt bara för att få vara med på sånt här. It's difficult for me to to uh, just know in words say what I feel, but uh, I'm happy to see the prophet to meet all the members and uh, uh, to feel the spirit of this conference. 1974, a year of a new prophet, broadened national exposure, the opening of another house of the Lord, a memorable area general conference, and changes in stewardships. Most of all though, 1974 was a year of firming foundations, refining functions, stretching strides. It was, in short, no ordinary year under the leadership of no ordinary man. This was the church in action.